Hi, thanks for coming here. This YouTube video, well, my first one actually, let's see how it goes. I am Prasanna Sitaraman, a fellow learner. My learning hasn't stopped even after two decades of finishing college. I have my training as an engineer in signal processing, work on wireless communications and so on. When it comes to machine learning and neural networks, for a while, I was having fun reading about all the hype in popular science articles. In fact, Gradient descent has been known in signal processing since Augustine Kochi wrote about it in 1800s. One fine day, I thought, well, I have been a spectator long enough, been watching from the sidelines. Let me get my hands dirty and build some neural networks. I wasn't even a Python programmer before this. I learned it bit by bit, reading and watching a lot of tutorials like the one I'm recording. Sometimes a beginner has insights that are taken for granted by experts and therefore not stressed explicitly. Sometimes, it just helps when we are sharing our knowledge and learning together. So this is not me teaching you, but sharing what I have learned. If that gives you some insights, I'm all the more glad for it. This is a video walkthrough of the article that I published in Towards Data Science, where I compared different neural network architectures, the deep neural nets, convolutional neural nets, and LSTM. It's meant to be a tutorial article for those who are getting started with machine learning. If you haven't taken the plunge yet, but are still testing the waters, I hope this video will motivate you to try out the machine learning code from my article. Once you get comfortable with building and training simple neural network models with TensorFlow, especially given how easy it is to do so with Keras, it is a lot of fun to play with on your free time and on weekends. You can try applying it to problems that are unique to your area or domain of expertise, or just experiment with the models to see what you get. You would be surprised more often than not at the results that you get with just a little effort. And well, getting surprised is fun. You can either use a local Python environment like Anaconda that, that you download and install on your computer or use Google Colab, which is an online Jupyter Notebook environment that is linked to your Google account. So just like the one that I'm using here. You also get the advantages of Google's high performance missions for training your neural network you don't need to worry about installing TensorFlow or other Python packages. Colab comes with all the usual packages. You can store your files on Google Drive, mount the drive, and access to the get access to the uh, files in your Jupyter Notebook. But Colab has limitations too. If you wanna use the webcam on your laptop, for example, there is no easy way to do that in Colab. Not, that, not, not one that I know of at least. But let's get back to the article. Let's quickly look at the different neural network architectures. First, there is a deep neural network. It consists of a set of neurons. Um, in each layer, that are fully connected to other set of neurons in adjacent layers. Each of these layers are called dense layers in Keras. Each neuron implements uh, y equals f of wx plus b where X is the input, W is a linear transformation, um, B is a bias and F is the nonlinear activation function, which is either tan H or sigmoid or ReLU or one of the many others. We train the weights and biases using back, back propagation, which using the Keras framework is encapsulated by model.fit. Let's look at convolutional neural networks or CNN. Convolution is an operation that generates an output sequence given an input sequence and a kernel. In signal processing, the kernel is called uh, an impulse response and the convolution operation is called filtering. What we do in CNN is to have convolutional layers to filter the signal before using a set of dense layers to generate the output. But since filtering with several parallel kernels increases the dimensionality, which may not be required, we reduce the dimension by uh, using pooling layers uh, before we map the uh, resulting tensor to the tense layer. Well, I'm saying tensor because uh, a multidimensional array can be thought of as a tensor. Mathematically, tensor is much more than just a multidimensional array, but that's not relevant in our context. Let me quickly introduce uh, the RNN and LSTM before we get into running the code. The RNN or recursive neural network looks back in time or rather 
looks across sequences of input vectors and, uh, or, or tensors. Remember, it's the same network, the same set of weights and biases that get trained over multiple input sequences. When we are computing the partial derivatives for updating weights, however, uh, we compute them for all the time steps. In fact, we just have to unroll the uh, RNN across time so that it looks like a, a sequence of connected layers. If you apply back, back propagation on it, but keep the weights the same for each layer, again, this is very important to remember, keeping the weights same for each unrolled layer, we will end up with equations that sum partial derivatives across these time steps. Well, just like how we don't need to know how internal combustion engine works to use the car, we can be blissfully oblivious of what goes on inside backprop to use the RNN. But it's always good to have a top level understanding though. Uh, the LSTM is just an RNN, but with a dense layer replaced by um, an LSTM layer. The LSTM layer has a specific structure to let the network remember some patterns and forget some other patterns. There are excellent tutorials on the web uh, explaining LSTM in great detail. And this video is just to show how quickly, how to quickly build an LSTM network with Keras. Once you get familiar with using it, you can then go deeper and learn more details about LSTM. All right, time to get into code now. After all, the main goal here is to provide you some working code and a little bit of motivation to experiment with it. We'll first create a, a deep neural network and train it for time series prediction. But to make it a little bit more fun, we will run the network in a perpetual signal generation mode where instead of predicting the next sample from previous samples, we will predict the next sample from previous predictions. That way, if the past predictions have a lot of error, we will see how much of this error impacts the future predictions. This is not just for our fancy little experiment, but there are practical uses for it. I briefly mentioned one example in my article that's from my domain expertise, but let's not digress to that in this video. The experiment is fun by itself without having to worry about where we would need this in practice. All right, let's get into the code now. For the time series, I like the sum of sinusoids. Just taking three sinusoids here, and they're already creating a signal that has a periodic pattern, which is hard to see. We'll now create the training data for DNN. We want DNN to predict the 65th sample when we provide uh, 64 samples as the input. So the first input vector will be sample 0 to 63. The output label will be uh, sample 64, which is the 65th sample because we are counting from zero. For the second input vector, uh, we will slide the window by one and take the samples one to 64. The output will be sample number 65. Uh, the third training vector will be uh, two to 65 uh, and, and so on. Now let's define the DNN model. The input data is 64 length, which is what we define with the uh, input shape parameter for the uh, dense layer. The first argument of the dense layer is the number of neurons in that layer. This means 64 samples are fully connected to these 32 neurons. Each neuron produces one output. So there are 32 outputs from the first layer. The second layer then takes uh, 32 inputs and produces eight outputs. The third layer takes eight inputs and produces one output. Note that there is no ReLU activation uh, for the last layer. You, we, we can't expect a, a, a negative signal with the ReLU activation. Right? We, we want to predict this negative signal. We will use the atom optimizer here. There are other optimizers that uh, you can try uh, when you run this code. Now that we have both the training data on the model, training the model is as easy as calling the model fit function. We are gonna run it for uh, about 100 epochs, uh, which basically means that we will loop over the same set of training data for 100 times to optimize the weights. We can split the training data into multiple batches and uh, let each batch be used in an epoch loop to update the weight, but we are not gonna do that here. In each iteration, the optimizer updates weights exactly once for each training data. 
So if there are thousand training data in one batch, there are thousand updates to weights happening in one epoch iteration. Hopefully I've explained that correctly. Feel free to let me know in the comments if I haven't. As we see from the uh, model summary, the first layer has uh, 64 times 32 weight matrix and 32 biases. So that is 2048 plus 32, which is 2080 params. You can do the calculation for the other layers to check if the number of uh, parameters match with the model summary. So on the whole, we have about 2353 params for this um, deep neural network that we have built. I encourage you to take the code from this article and run it near Python TensorFlow environment and experiment with it. Well, here is the prediction part, and as you see, uh, we, we are able to uh, predict quite nicely. No, no surprises there. Let's now try to uh, make more predictions based on old predictions. We're just uh, using the DNN prediction array that stores uh, uh, th that, that stores all the predictions so far, and then run it in a loop to make one prediction at a time. And append the vector. Uh, that, with that prediction and, and repeat the process. Now, we, we, we see that without any additional inputs, the inputs uh, stop when the red curve stops. We are able to continue generating the blue curve based on you know, just the past predictions, which is quite nice. This means uh, we can train the DNN to learn the signal that we want to generate and use it to generate uh, that signal pretty much by itself without no external inputs. Now make it act like a perpetual signal generating network. All right, onwards to CNN then. We're using only 16 samples as input at this time. Um, just pick that number because I wanted to see if the uh, CNN can match DNN performance, even if you give it less samples. Getting the training data ready is pretty much uh, similar to DNN. We just have to take care to match the input shape depending on what is expected by the Keras convolutional layer. We again define a sequential Keras model. The first layer will be a 1D convolutional layer because the uh, input is just a vector. We're using three different filters in this layer. Uh, each filter has a kernel of length four that makes it three times four, 12 params plus uh, one bias per filter, which is 15 params. This is followed by the pooling layer whose output then is connected to the dense layer. The pooling layer has no parameters uh, to be tuned since it only takes the average or min or max uh, of the input set. By the time we uh, reach the dense layer, we can see that uh, we have reduced the uh, 16 samples uh, or futures to only nine. This reduces the number of parameters needed for the dense layers. Um, and as you can see, out of the 192 parameters, uh, most of the parameters are coming from the dense layers here. The training is again uh, done using model fit. And we see from model summary that the CNN has a uh, yeah, much smaller number of parameters. Okay. And, and prediction looks good even with just 182 parameters. Right? There is a little bit of error here and there, but it, it overall follows the shape of the curve. Let's see how, we'll, how it'll perform in the uh, signal generator mode now. We see that even though the signal generator performance is good, it is missing out on this low frequency envelope. Will it perform better if we increase the network size? Well, let's try it out. We'll go change the uh, input size from 16 to 64, which is just changing one parameter. And uh, let's run till the uh, signal generation mode. The signal generation performance looks good now, and the CNN is able to catch all the patterns. We see that the number of parameters is still only 768, uh, compared to the uh, 2353 that we had for DNN. So there is a good reason for coming up with different architectures, right? Let's look at the LSTM now. 
defining the LSTM model is fairly easy. Just add uh, an LSTM layer followed by a dense layer to generate the output. As with CNN, we need to ensure that the input shape is matched to what is expected by the LSTM layer in Keras. We're gonna use a loopback of four, which means we are, going to we are going to give our LSTM network four sequences of the length eight vector. This is a total of 32 samples, which uh, we then take 32 samples at a time, then reshape it to uh, batch size, loopback, input size, that the LSTM layer expects. The output corresponding to this input will then be the 33rd sample. For the subsequent inputs, we slide the uh, 32 samples window by one until we exhaust the number of samples in our time series. Let's quickly run through the model training. You, you, you see from model summary that the uh, number of parameters is only about half of DNN, but the uh, training takes twice as long. Training uh, LSTM is a lot slower than other architectures. Uh, the, the prediction looks good. The signal generation could be better though. Let's go and uh, increase the loop, loop back from four to eight so that the LSTM is also looking at the uh, same number of samples as DNN. And then we will see how well the prediction or the, the signal generation looks. Let's now just change this parameter and then run all this until the signal generation part. Now, the prediction looks much better. Notice from the model summary, uh, how the number of parameters haven't really increased. Okay. So that's the advantage of LSTM compared to DNN. We can look really long into the past without increasing the number of parameters that we need to train. All right, so what have we learned so far? We looked at the different neural network architectures, uh, DNN, CNN, and RNN, or the LSTM version of it. We see that the CNN has a lower number of parameters, a testament to the power of combining concepts from signal processing to machine learning. LSTM also has lower parameters than DNN, but the training is a lot slower. LSTM, however, has the advantage that with the same size network, we can look long into the past if we need it. With that, let's wrap up the video. Over the years, I have learned a lot of subjects using the internet, not just from the excellent video lectures from great institutions such as MIT that are made available for free, you know, the, like the MIT OCW, but also from several people around the web collectively contributing their knowledge, simplifying concepts, and providing different levels of understanding. I hope this video serves as my little way of paying it forward. Thanks very much for your time and have an excellent day.